The head in the wall was crusted and decayed, mummified in its plastic shroud. The withered face opened mouthed in a scream. Or maybe the jaw loosened as the muscles decayed. The plastic is what's held on the smell, though I do vaguely remember sometimes an odor permeating, especially during steamy summers. I was always told the smell was garbage. Alongside the head, other parts sat stored in plastic bins. When I finally saw the corpse from the wall reassembled, it was hard to believe that anybody would do this to another human. Harder still to imagine it was my own father who had committed such horrific acts. Before I continue, a warning. If you're triggered by any graphic descriptions, do not read further. Mine is a harrowing account. I grew up in a house surrounded by bodies. The bodies of childhood playmates and acquaintances. When asked why he had done it, my father always gave the same answer. As I recount the story now, I picture him in that interview room, how he must have looked facing the police. Victor Chen was a small, nervous, almost delicate man. He must have been petrified, his eyes swollen shut and his lip bleeding, his hands rubbing and rubbing, nails digging deeper into the flesh of his wrists and palms as they peppered him with the same questions over and over. Why? Why children? Why in the walls? Why? I had to. Tears running down his cheeks. This was all that he would say. I had to. Why little kids, you sicko? I imagine the officer's sneer. Imagine how my father cowered as the man struck him. We know what you did to them. Why you wanted them. No, I never did anything to them. I just killed them. You just killed them? Yes. You expect me to believe. I had to. Piece of trash. If the interrogation went anything like my father said, that officer beat him within an inch of his life. Only after he was on the floor groaning and at the brink of unconsciousness did the second officer intervene, pulling back the violent one. They hustled my father back into his chair. The calmer officer spoke in measured tones. Now, Mr. Chen, tell me what happened to Mary Louise, Kaylee Jensen, Kyle Sanderson, Terry Cho, Evie Connor. You obviously put a lot of thought into everything. Packing them into the walls takes a lot of material and preparation. You must have had a reason for choosing them. What was it? But he would not say. When I confronted him, it did not go much better at first. He wouldn't speak for ages. Just sat there with his head down and tears dripping from his eyes. Finally, his gaze lifted. I suppose you think I'm a monster, he whispered. Are you? I asked. He burst into sobs. Through his hands, his muffled, repeated line. I had to. My father's crimes were not motivated by any of the reasons commonly ascribed to serial killers. They were not sexual in nature, and while most of the victims were minors, they ranged in age from 8 to 18. And he also murdered his own brother. Regardless of who they were, all bodies received the same treatment. Dismemberment, plastic wrap, concealment in the walls. Some were childhood friends of mine, though none of them close. He chose carefully, it seems, meticulous with his murders as with his blueprints. He was an architect, a trade that served him well. And yet growing up, I never had the slightest inkling of what lay within our walls. Indeed, I could not have imagined it. My father was shy and soft-spoken in public, warm and kind in private. What I remember most about him is his laughter, the way his eyes would crinkle. He was devoted to the memory of my mother, who passed away when I was so little that I could not remember her. 
In later years, I often saw him with dark circles under his eyes, and his smile became rarer. Our relationship was strained by my teenage rebelliousness, but one thing I was certain of growing up, he loved me more than anything or anyone in the world. Yet when I look back now, I can see that there were always hints of his darker tendencies. For example, when I was seven years old, he taught me to butcher a pig. Now to my mind, this is not something to expose to a small child. But there we were, a pig splayed out on the basement table, his eyes glassy and mouth gaping, blood dripping from its severed head onto his shoes. He explained that rather than buy meat in expensive packaging, we could save money by butchering and freezing the meat ourselves. Of course, I shrieked hysterically. He clicked his tongue, chopping off its trotters and dropping them in a bucket as he reminded me how I loved bacon, and pretending the bacon just magically appeared in an aisle in the grocery store was a kind of dangerous magical thinking that allowed all sorts of atrocities. You can do anything evil, he declared, if you sanitize it in plastic. A chilling statement in retrospect. Then there was the time my uncle came to work for us. My father did not like Uncle Rudy. I have a better understanding of why now, but at the time, all I knew was that Uncle Rudy was perpetually borrowing money. At the urging of my grandparents, my father, who was never rich but made enough to live comfortably, hired Uncle Rudy to do some work on the exterior of the house. There were strict parameters my uncle had to follow. Some of these were sensible, such as to not consume alcohol. But other precautions struck me as harsh. For example, my uncle was only briefly allowed to come inside for bathroom breaks, and at all other times, even for lunch or water breaks, he had to remain outside in the sweltering sun. But as was often the case in those days, my father wasn't always present to enforce these rules. One day, when I got into trouble at school, my father could not be reached. It was Uncle Rudy who picked up the phone and agreed to come and get me. At home, he gave me a Coke. My father only let me have soda occasionally, claiming that it was bad for my teeth, and told me the girls who bullied me were a bunch of idiots. I giggled, reveling in his comment and feeling immediate kinship with him. Thereafter, while my father was away at work, I would invite Uncle Rudy to sneak inside to watch TV with me. He was always smiling and chummy, and when he started drinking beer while I had a soda, it was our little secret. We were both breaking my father's rules. Then one day as we sat watching TV on the sofa, he squeezed me and told me what a special little girl I was. Didn't I know how special? His breath, a stink of beer, and his sweaty hairy arm draped over me. I didn't like his face so close but didn't know what to do or say, and he kept rubbing my back, his hands sliding under my cotton shirt, his fingers hot on my skin. He leaned his head close to mine, his lips against my ears speaking softly like he was trying to make me feel better, only he made my inside squirm. That was when my father came home. Uncle Rudy withdrew immediately as the door opened, but my father must have suspected something because his eyes narrowed to slits. He sent Uncle Rudy outside to finish working, and right away sat me down to ask me what had happened. Oh, he was just asking me about school. For some reason, I felt compelled to protect my uncle. My father's eyes honed in on the beer. Was he drinking? Only a little. Sadie, love, I promise that you're not in any trouble. No, no trouble you hear. But it's very important that you tell me the truth. Did he? Was he sitting very close to you? Touching you? I couldn't meet my father's keen eyes. I nodded, biting my lap, feeling like I had betrayed Uncle Rudy. But also, I hadn't liked his closeness, his beer-stinking breath. 
My father was always clean and smelling of cologne or aftershave, and not sweaty and breathy like Uncle Rudy. I explained. He was rubbing my back. Like this. My father rubbed my back. Under my shirt, I admitted. He went pale, but just as quickly his expression smoothed over. Well, sweetheart, we'll talk a little more later, okay? Thank you for telling me. You're a very bright girl, and the girls at school who've been bullying you are all stupid heads. I giggled. Yeah, they are. Big, dumb, stupid heads. The biggest and the dumbest. My father poked me, which made me squeal, and then told me to go up to my room, read some books, and that we would go and get ice cream later. I just need to have a quick word with Uncle Rudy about the yard. All right. Go on, then. I went upstairs, smiling. But I knew that he was putting me on, and so I snuck back downstairs to eavesdrop. As I neared the office door, I caught my uncle's booming protestation. What? Jesus Christ, I was comforting her, that's all. What do you think I was doing? God, bro. The screech of a chair against the floor. Through the gap in the door, I could see my father lunge, gripping my uncle by the shirt. My father was, as I've mentioned, a slight man, especially compared to my bullish uncle. And yet whatever it was my father had hissed into his face, it made my uncle go pale with fear, recoiling as if my father were a spitting cobra. Freaking crazy, burst Uncle Rudy, breaking his grip and storming out. Both of them saw me, but Uncle Rudy just flared his nostrils and bouldered past. I stood awkwardly in the hall, trembling. The feral rage vanished from my father's face, and he rushed over. Oh, Sadie, I'm so sorry. I should have known better. Your grandparents, they begged me to help him. I thought if I had rules. I'm so sorry, my darling. I didn't really understand at the time why he was so distraught. My uncle had done nothing but rub my back and tickle my ear with his whiskers and disgusting beer breath. I didn't know about the other things my uncle had done at my grandparents had hushed up, protecting their eldest son. And even though I had come out of the encounter unscathed, I think my father still felt the deepest regrets. Things became very strained between him and my grandparents after that. He stopped taking me to visit them. We were isolated, a family of two, another reason perhaps, that no one suspected what he hid in those walls for so much time. There was nobody in our lives except for us. If it's hard for you to reconcile this paternal figure with the bodies dismembered and wrapped in plastic, well imagine how hard it was for me when I finally figured out what he had been up to all these years. The first disappearance happened when I was in second grade. I had a sleepover just before my 8th birthday, celebrating early because my birthday fell on a school night, and my father was very strict about the importance of school. Four friends came over and we were slicing the cake when a little girl knocked on my door. Her name was Mary and she lived up the street. During summers when school was out and my friends were on vacation, there weren't many other kids on our block. So Mary and I were sort of stuck with each other as playmates. But when school started up again, I would usually shun her in favor of school friends until the next summer. She knocked on my door to invite me over, but seeing that I was having a sleepover, she got very excited. I didn't want her joining us, and I gave her some white lie about how we didn't have enough cake. I'm not sure how, just shy of eight years old. I already had a facility for white lies. Or what this says about the example that my father set. Mary's face reddened at my rejection, and she was about to sulk away when my father told her of course she could join the party. And when she refused, he offered to at least get her a party gift bag. Mary looked at the toys that my school friends had gotten in their gift bags and temptation won over pride. She waited while he prepped the bag. He gave me a look, a look that he would give when I hadn't done my chores that had poorly on a test or otherwise disappointed him. And then he brought the gift bag out to Mary. 
certain that he would reprimand me later. I stuffed myself with cake. As if eating as much as possible, I was somehow proving my right to have everything my way. Later, my friends and I were in my room in a sea of beds laid out on the floor, with a tent for me and fairy lights strung up all around it. I was feeling in good spirits by then, so when my father came in to wish us good night, I asked him if Mary had liked her gift bag. Rather than the reproach that I was expecting, he actually flinched, mumbled good night, and served us all bedtime hot cocoa. I didn't finish mine because I had had so much cake. In retrospect, this is probably the reason I woke up. It was the scream that jolted me awake. I shot up gasping, eyes wide, goosebumps prickling my arms. Vaguely, I wondered if I had only been having a nightmare. Pushing the covers off, I set my feet on the floor. My friends were all sound asleep. Light shone under the bedroom door. Careful not to step on any of my cocooned friends, I tiptoed to the door and peeked out into the brightly lit hallway. Dad? Silence. I padded down the staircase. In the shadowed living room, remnants from our party lay scattered around the sofa. And that was unusual. My father was very tidy and never left a mess overnight. Light poured from the kitchen door and I went in, observing the mound of dishes stacked by the sink, cake crumbs and frosting encrusting the plates. At the far end of the kitchen, the basement door was ajar, and from below, rustling, the crackle of plastic, the chest freezer opening and closing, then the tread of footsteps on the stairs. I stood frozen. A deer in the headlights as the door hinges creaked and my father emerged. He was dressed in what looked like baggy, throwaway clothes from Goodwill, with an apron tied around his waist, an apron soaked in red, and his face bore an expression that I had never seen before, a peculiar, manic gleam in his eye. Dad? He stopped in his tracks, a voice hoarse. Sadie... I just looked at his bloody apron. He quickly removed it and bunched it into the sink. Sadie, what are you doing awake? It's three in the morning. Is that blood? His eyelids fluttered. And then he said, Go sit at the table. I sat. I heard the kitchen faucet turn on and the sounds of scrubbing. The flicker of the stove. A few moments later, my father came in with a cup of hot cocoa which he insisted I drink. I became drowsy even before I finished it, and all but collapsed in my chair, only vaguely aware as he lifted me and carried me upstairs. I remember feeling sick, partly from the drink but mostly from the smell. He smelled so strongly of blood. In the morning, I woke to an empty bedroom. My father told me my friends were all at school, but he hadn't wanted to disturb me. I was feeling groggy and unwell, so I believed him when he said that I had a fever. By afternoon, I was better, and the next day, I went to school as normal. You might wonder why I never suspected anything, but when I saw all my friends the next day, they all teased me for being gluttonous and eating too much cake and they exclaimed about the fairy lights and gift bags. That was all. Everything seemed normal. Besides, it was not long after that incident, the very day after the party in fact, that my father showed me how to butcher a pig. And so the image of my father in a bloody apron became firmly associated with pork in our chest freezer. If I had any recollection of screams in the middle of the night... Well, I assumed it was a pig. A few days later, my father did some renovations, tearing open the space under the stairs and patching it up over some leaky pipes. When a garbage smell permeated the walls, he told me that it was sewage, that it was a pipe problem, but that it would go away soon. And it did. And when I finally wondered again about Mary after she didn't turn up to play for weeks, well, 
The story of the girl who went missing on our street seemed a tragic, cautionary tale. Sad but unrelated to our house. My father acted very sorry when he found out. He sent flowers to the family and always referred to her as that poor, sweet girl and wouldn't let me wander our neighborhood alone because of what had happened. Is it any wonder I was completely taken in? I had no idea. Until the day her mummified corpse was discovered in our house, and the decade-old missing persons case finally solved. But why did my father butcher my playmate, dismember her and wrap her in plastic to putrefy behind the floral wallpaper? There are many theories. Some claim my father had a disassociative identity disorder, a classic split personality. The meek, sensitive father who was a good man, and his evil twin killing as a means of asserting control, breaking all the taboos that held meek Victor in submission, a domineering hide to his cowering Jekyll. Or another theory. Victor Chen suffered some form of psychosis and was given to visual and auditory hallucinations. He heard voices dictating what he should do, and believed that if he did not obey, terrible things would happen to his family. And so he succumbed to these violent delusions, though they were merely products of a damaged brain. Or the most popular theory, that he was just evil. That his mild-mannered persona was a front beneath which lurked a scheming Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer. This theory, by far the most popular, is the one that makes the least sense to me. Because you would not think such a predator would make an exception for his own daughter. And typically abusers target those closest to them. And yet I never saw this side of him that people claim was his true self only the occasional mysterious glimmer of desperation, and the sense, especially throughout my teenage years, that some sort of shadow was devouring him from the inside. The next two disappearances happened in my tweens. The first was a girl from school who was supposed to come over for a project. She never showed. Police interviewed me and my father several times, but since I truthfully reported that I never saw her, I think the suspicion that might otherwise have settled on my father was deflected. The second was the first and only boy among his victims. Kyle Sanderson had been blowing spitballs and pulling my hair on the bus to school. When I complained about it to my father, he questioned me intently. The boy's name, where he lived, where he was picked up by the bus. He said that he would call the school. A few days later, Kyle was not on the bus. I assume my father had somehow made arrangements to rearrange our bus pickups, but when I asked, my father admitted he had been too busy and hadn't contacted the district. He promised he would soon. But of course, Kyle never returned to the bus. We children were once again put under strict watch and ordered never to walk alone in the streets. Mary Lewis, Kaylee Jensen, and now Kyle Sanderson Somewhere in our quiet burb lived a predator. Each time a disappearance happened, the garbage smell would return. Just a faint whiff that wouldn't let up. And my father would forbid me from having friends over, making excuses that the pipes were bad, or an animal had died in the attic. And soon enough it would fade. It wasn't until the most recent time when my father was finally caught that I saw his true, monstrous nature, because I was the one who caught him. I was 17 and excited for a weekend trip with my best friend, Mickey. We were planning to go swimming and have a bonfire party at Mickey's cousin's house. My overprotective father had never once allowed me to stay out past an 11pm curfew, so to go unchaperoned through the whole weekend felt like the most liberating thing in the world. Frankly, it was odd that he had agreed to it, but I figured all my rebellious sniping had finally worn him down. His manner was almost mechanical when he warned me against the use of alcohol and reminded me to text him when I arrived. As he was walking me to Mickey's car, he also warned me to be careful about boys at the party. Plenty of friends, he said, had dark secrets and couldn't be trusted. 
especially after a few drinks. Rolling my eyes and promising for the umpteenth time that I'd be safe, I left. But during the long drive, Miki and I got into a heated argument. I don't remember what it was about now, just that I had called her silly and shallow, and she called me selfish and melodramatic. Before I knew it, I was on my way home, in a taxi, since I couldn't bear the shame of both bailing on the trip and having to be collected like an immature baby by my father. I cried all the way back, so I suppose, yes, I was being pretty melodramatic. It was well after midnight by the time that I finally entered the house, and I was greeted with the sound of banging. I stopped in the door and mouth agape. My father hadn't told me of any renovation plans, but the lights were on upstairs, the banging sounds coming from my bedroom. Dad? I called. Immediately the banging stopped, the rustle of plastic and hurried footsteps. My father came out, shutting the door to my bedroom just as I had made it to the top of the stairs. Sadie, he looked panicked. What are you doing here? Why are you in my room? All I wanted was to fling myself on my bed, scream into my pillow and cry about my spoiled trap. The last thing I needed was my father to be in one of his house rearranging moods, especially not in my room. Renovations? You weren't supposed to be back until Monday. Mickey was being annoying. I tried to push past him, but he blocked my way. No, there's asbestos. It's dangerous to breathe. You're not wearing a mask. Suddenly suspicious, I felt a flash of anger and sensed that he had violated my privacy by entering my room. And maybe, just maybe, the suspicion of some darker secret sparked in me. A spark of fear, uncertainty. Because why was my father lying about asbestos? What was he hiding in there? I grabbed the knob. No! His hands gripped my arms. Go back downstairs, take your bag, and leave. How, Dad? Leave! His grip was like talons. So tight it felt like that he might break the skin. Tears started into my eyes. His manner, the wild gleam in his eye, all of it set my heart hammering. Panic gave me a strength to break loose and shove him. He slammed hard against the wall. I grabbed the knob and rushed in. No, 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 don't! His warning dissolved into a wall, and I glimpsed him biting his fist to control sudden sobbing. I slammed the door and locked it behind me. Terrified, I had never seen him in such a state and then I turned and saw what he was hiding. My eyes raked across my belongings, arranged in one corner of the room. They were all the items from my closet, I realized, carefully sorted and stacked, far neater than the pile that I usually left. The closet door was open, and the framing of a false wall lay partially constructed at the very back, shortening the walk-in space by about a foot. Shoved into this area were plastic bins and plastic bags, but my father had not finished stuffing them all back there. One of the bags, tightly wrapped and swathed in layers of plastic, lay on the floor at my feet, as if hastily dropped when he heard my call. I bent down to lift it, turning it in my hands and then, I gasped. The bag fell from my fingers. Hair? Was that a head of black hair? There was another bag nearby. A simple plastic shopping bag from Hot Topic. It contained a rumpled, girl's tee, torn jeans, jacket. None of them mine. Another bin contained a pair of Doc Martens, well worn. I looked down to the bag that I had dropped with the hair. Pushed it with my toe. Through the thick plastic, I could just see wide eyes gaping out at me the ghostly impression of a face. I screamed. I don't know how long I stood there screaming before my father's hands tried to pull me away. I broke free and ran, out of the house, up the street. I should have pounded on a neighbor's door, should have screamed the whole quiet little cul-de-sac alert, but I didn't. Oh God, oh God, 
I sobbed over and over, trying to come up with a plan, trying to conceive some explanation other than the obvious, something that might account for the strange smells, the walls torn open and replaced, a hallway shortened here, a closet sealed there, the rotting garbage smell. Oh God, oh God, oh God. In the end, I went back, because as shocked and stupefied as I was even then, with the proof right in front of me, I never believed I was in any danger. It didn't even occur to me right then that he might hurt me. I walked right upstairs. The bedroom door was closed. From beyond, the whir of a drill. Rustling, shuffling, more drilling. He must have heard my return, yet he continued his work. I sat down with my back against the door, picked up my phone from where I had dropped it in our struggle, and dialed 911. Speaking very quietly, tears dribbling down my face, I related what I had seen to the dispatcher. When the police arrived, my father promptly surrendered. I went to stay with my grandparents while the house became a crime scene. Ultimately, seven bodies were found in the walls. Most of the minors, though, there were two adults, Hot Topic Girl and just had turned 18, as well as my Uncle Rudy. The fates of Mary Lewis, Kaylee Jensen, and Kyle Sanderson were at last known. While the community reeled, all eyes turned to me, wondering, how could I have lived in that house and not known? Had I been an accomplice, like father, like daughter? How could I have grown up surrounded by the bodies of my playmates, wrinkling my nose at the smell of their corpses, putrefying in the walls around me, and just not known? I cannot tell you anything beyond what I already have. I believe the lies my father told me. I have wrestled with myself every night since I found out, over my complacency, my childish faith, my sheer stupidity, as I repeat to myself the same question everybody else has asked, over and over and over. How could I have not known? But there's another question, the more important one. Why? Why did he do it? My father wouldn't tell anything to investigators, to his own attorney, to these psychiatrists who evaluated him for trial. He neither confirmed nor denied his crimes. He wouldn't speak. He just sat in his cell and cried and the only phrase he uttered when pressed was, I had to. There was only one person that he finally consented to speak with, and so I was summoned. After a briefing with police and prosecutors, after assuring them of my cooperation and that I too wanted to know the truth, that I would do anything to try to understand, they arranged for me to visit with my father the first time that I saw him since the arrest. When I came into the small, spare room for an interview, I was shocked at the sight of him. Filthy and battered, his face a bloodied mess, one eye swollen close, and his arms raked with scratches that he seemed to have put there himself, dragging his nails through his skin. He was fidgeting when I entered, head down, unwilling to make eye contact. Finally, his head lifted it just a little. He blinked, slowly wiped the tears from his eyes, and dropped his gaze again. I suppose you think I'm a monster, he whispered. Are you? I asked. He burst into sobs, but after they had passed and decomposed himself, after he had asked how I was doing and whether I was going to finish school and how my college applications were going, after I finally told him that none of that was why I was here, finally, finally, he told me why. Contrary to rumor, I hadn't the slightest inkling about the true source of the garbage smell when I was growing up. I believed my father when he told me that it was just the pipes in the walls. You see, I had a very ordinary girlhood, playing with other children in our quiet little cul-de-sac in our sleepy neighborhood shaded by oak and sycamore trees. There were whispers, of course, of a predator, and an undercurrent of fear. But like most children, I remained blissfully secure in my certainty 
that the adults in my life would protect me. Indeed, in all my wildest imaginings, I couldn't have conceived that behind my father's gentle smile was a man who could murder my playmates in cold blood, chop apart their bodies and stash them behind the walls. But there were signs. He kept an axe downstairs in the basement, always sharp, yet we had no chimney or fireplace or any wood to chop. Our home underwent frequent renovations to fix leaky pipes or add improvements, like false walls. Strangely, it was only after these adjustments that a rank rotting odor would permeate. When my father finally confessed, I learned that the murders began long before my first memories of the disappearances. It began before I was born, in fact. It was my mother who was afflicted. He never knew where the affliction came from. Just that after I was born, mere days after, in fact, she tried to strangle me. He had saved me just in time and she was hospitalized for postpartum psychosis. My father bottle fed me and my sole caretaker during my mother's intensive treatment. She came back restored and their lives returned to the normal joy of newlyweds with a cherished infant. Until the evening, he found her bleeding out in the bathtub and me, unresponsive, drowned beside her. Frantic, he scooped me out and rushed to revive me, wept when I finally coughed and drew breath, screamed at my mother while desperately trying to bind her wrist, but she grabbed a hold of him and said sobbing, I tried, I tried, all I wanted was an ordinary normal life. And then she whispered something to him that, in the moment, he assumed it must have been a sign of her madness. She bled out before he could save her. What did she say? I asked, sitting across from him in the cramped interview room where he confessed to me. That she was sorry, but it wouldn't let her die without... His next words were mumbled so quietly that I missed them. It, I echoed. It made me do all this. I had to or it. It wanted me to hurt you. Dad, what is it? You're saying you're possessed, that it's some kind of demon. He sighed, ran his fingers dark with blood from picking at the scabs on his arms through his unwashed hair. It was strange to see him in such a filthy state. He was normally so well kept, almost a feat. A demon, yes, he said tiredly. So why didn't you try an exorcism? Call a priest or something? The whole demon excuse sounded like BS. I tried, he burst. Don't you think I tried? It started right after your mother died, these small tiny urges. Almost insignificant. I would see you sleeping so soundly there and I would think, what if I put the pillow over her? What if I squeezed your tiny little hand until it bled? What if instead of tickling those little toes, I just bit them off? Dad, I recoiled, disgusted. I didn't want these thoughts, he shouted. Fingers curled into claws that he raked across the back of his neck. I didn't want them. They came in and they got louder, more insistent. I couldn't tune them out. I don't know what it was, or I thought it was just a sickness in me. I went to doctors, psychiatrists. I doped myself up. I tried priests, a prayer, and yes, I did an exorcism. It was strange to hear this coming from his mouth. I tried all of it, but it wouldn't stop. The only thing that made the voices still was, was what? I asked as he got this far away haunted look, and I knew that he was reliving something. Reliving what though? Killing children, taking apart their bodies, burying them in the walls. I shuddered, sickened. Was what, dad? Giving in. He said finally, eyelids fluttering closed. He dropped his head in his hands. Giving in, I repeated. So what? You just started following children. No, it, it was gradual. I, I started with animals. The pig, I said, color draining from my face as I remembered his first attempt to teach me butchery. At age seven. No, no long before that. 
I started with chickens, he sighed. I discovered that killing any kind of killing left me free for a while. But within a few months, the whispers would come back louder, and I would have to escalate, like, like upping a dosage. He rubbed his eyes. Finally, I understood the strange black moods that gripped your mother, brewing until she... she... Don't you blame her! I growled, clenching my fist. What happened to her was tragic. Don't you dare pretend that you're like her. Oh, Sadie, he shook his head. Of course I'm not like her. If I were, you would be just another family secret. Buried like your dead aunt or like what Uncle Rudy did to that girl. Conveniently forgotten so your grandparents could pretend to have perfect families. Your dead mother was a pretty picture on your dresser. Tragically passed from illness, they always said. But it wasn't like that when she was alive. She was funny, smart, charming but also deeply, deeply difficult. Since you're asking for a confession, Sadie, the murders in our family didn't start with me. Everything began with her. My father met my mother at an event at the Chinese Culture Center where both their families were occasionally involved. Neither my father nor my mother were much interested in the goings-on and the pair of them escaped together to spend the evening walking and chatting, lost in each other's company. They fell very quickly in love and conceived me out of wedlock, much to the chagrin of both their families. They married to appease the older generations, but by all accounts, they were happy. Happy, that is, except for the shadow that descended over my mother. One night, my father told me as she lay in bed beside him, her belly round and heavy with me. She asked him if he was superstitious. Did he believe in spirits, demons? What about the idea that twins could feel each other after death? No, he said. I don't believe in any of those things. Why are you asking? I bet, she said, with a strange and strained smile. You didn't know I had a twin sister. He didn't. In fact, he thought that she was joking at first. He only confirmed the existence of her twin later speaking with her grandmother, who admitted that the twin had drowned tragically at the age of 12 in the neighbor's swimming pool. The family was devastated. How she had drowned in relatively shallow water with a floating pool toy nearby, when by all accounts she was a skilled swimmer. It was a mystery. It was also strange that she had been found alone, given the twins were usually inseparable. As for my mother, to have her twin ripped away from her at such a young age was like losing half her soul. She burst into tears whenever her sister's name was spoken to her. Yet when she finally recovered, she blossomed like they had never seen. And then she met my father. Dad, really, I said. He never spoke much of my mother when I was growing up, and though I knew she had died young after a struggle with mental illness, this was the first that I had heard of a sibling. A twin? A twin you've never told me about, who you're implying that she drowned. Watch your tongue, Sadie. I could have smacked him. As his brow knit, I added, Even if Mom had a sister, why would you assume there's some deep, dark secret there? You haven't told me anything that would imply it wasn't an accident. Mom probably wound up with postpartum psychosis because she had unprocessed grief from losing her twin. Not just hers. He said his voice suddenly devoid of inflection. What? I blinked. When he did not explain, I demanded. What do you mean? Who else has a... I paused, blood running cold. Family secrets. His dark eyes leveled with mine. Dad, I said, heart quickening. Dad, who else has a... Check your birth certificate. You're lying. I would have known. He would have told me. Someone would have told me. This all has to be some elaborate concoction, warping our family history to shift blame. She didn't have postpartum psychosis, he said. I caught her just in time to save you.
Just you. You're lying. I don't know why I fought so hard to discredit this particular part of his account. Especially because it could be so easily verified by a glance at my birth certificate, which I had at home. I suppose because it shattered the image pre-children in the walls that I had had of our family. Like biting into a perfectly red and beautiful apple only to find that the inside is black and rotten. Everything I knew about my parents was a lie. Really, it was a carefully curated image. And while I had already given up on having a good father, I didn't want to lose the idea I held of my mother too. I couldn't actually remember her, of course. There were only photographs of a beautiful young woman with an angelic smile, always with a flower in her long, glossy hair. Growing up, I used to kiss her picture goodnight, entranced by the tale of a young woman dead of a tragic illness. I suppose I imagined that she would have been the perfect parent had she lived. My father who raised me with enough loving kindness to almost match my imaginary version of my mother never disillusioned me about her perfection. Until now. His lips pursed, head cocked at my denial, and then he said, Excuse me. Turning away, he slammed his fist so hard into the table that I heard the crack of his knuckles as he broke them. I gasped, recoiling as he hunched over his broken hand, with his teeth clenched at the pain, eyes tearing, saliva and blood bubbling at his mouth. And then he sat up, cradling the broken hand and said, It was telling me to smash your face in. Now then, uh, the children. Why did I start killing children? That's what you really want to know. I didn't, I didn't want to know. But the officers who were monitoring our discussion would be appalled if I abandoned the interview now, just as he was approaching the critical point. So I told him that I needed a bathroom break. I fled and leaned over the bathroom sink, splashing cold water on my face from the faucet. I closed my eyes and put down my head, pretending for a few minutes that I was anywhere but here, interviewing my axe-murderer father about secrets. I wish that I had never unearthed. Finally, I forced myself to look in the mirror, into the face that had my mother's high cheekbones and my father's narrow eyes. The pair of them really had been a picture-perfect couple. What other rot would I expose if I dug deeper? Finally, I marched back out to the interview room to face the monster and my father. I nearly suffocated you when you were five years old. He said without preamble. What? I had no memory of this. You were asking me a question, just some innocent question. You had thousands of questions in those days. In sudden rage, it seized me and I just grabbed your face, cupped my hand over your nose and mouth like this. He mimed the action, his broken hand cradling the back of an invisible head and the other hand cupping over an imaginary mouth and nose. The voices, they were loud that day, deafening like, like church bells. They kept telling me to squeeze, so I held you while you flailed and turned purple until you went limp. His hand squeezed tighter. In spite of myself, I felt my heart pounding, felt myself counting the seconds. He kept squeezing, not looking at me, but at some distant memory. And then abruptly, he let go. I exhaled, not even realizing that I had been holding my breath until his eyes flickered up to me again. You woke up in just a couple of minutes. I, I don't remember any of this. Well, you were only five years old. He paused. And I comforted you right afterwards and told you that you had had a bad dream. You lied to me, I said, accusing. He gave me a look. Yes, sweetie, I lied to you rather than explain to you that daddy was possessed and purposefully suffocated you. I glowered and crossed my arms. Yeah, sure, good call, I guess. Dad of the year. He actually laughed. Just a short, little laugh, but it was the first spark I had seen of the man I knew before he retreated into his shell again. 
I didn't trust myself with you after that, so I dropped you off with your grandparents. And then I tried to end myself. A noose, a gun, sleeping pills. But it wouldn't let me go through with it. I finally understood what your mother went through. I went back to your grandparents and picked you up. Just like her, I was going to... to... His voice cracked. He had been numb telling me about the loss of my mother, but as he described his plans to end my life, emotion finally broke through. He put a hand over his mouth to hold on the sobs and said, Because of how I had choked you, I was expecting you to be afraid, ready to have to coax you, but... He shook his head. The moment I arrived, you just... You flew into my arms. You were so happy to see me. Daddy, daddy, you said. So, so excited to be coming home with me, beaming and smiling. And I just... He blinked quickly. I knew then that I was going to, to fight it. For a little while, just you were enough to keep away the darkness. He was crying now. I reached across and he squeezed my hand, his fingers dirty and his nails crusted with blood. And then he let go, reached down and grabbed his shirt and pulled it up over his head. I gaped, shrinking back. He had always been so proper, always in a button down and usually a tie. I had never seen him shirtless, not even at the beach. His entire torso from front and back was covered in crisscrossing scars. Some deep, some shallow, some very fresh, but most quite old. Hearing me suck in a breath, he pulled his shirt back on. I did try to fight it in all kinds of ways, but, he shrugged, it stopped working. And then, having finished the account of our family, he told me about how his own murders began. If you're here for all of the grisly specifics of each particular murder, which wall he tore open and which implements he used to take which bodies apart, you're in the wrong place. My goal isn't to titulate with a gruesome recounting, but to understand why. Why in the walls? Why specifically children? In any case, my father spared me the worst of the details. That part of his confession he saved for the police. But as to the matter of why, I must begin with Mary Lewis. Her murder was unplanned. The voices were particularly loud that day, he said of Mary. I really did mean to send her straight home. But she mentioned her mother was napping, how bored she was so she came over. I realized no one was likely to notice her missing just yet and um, he rubbed his face unable to look at me. I, 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 um, I strangled her, hid her in the bushes behind the house until you were asleep, and then I, I chopped her up and put her in the freezer, and that's when you caught me when I was, uh, cleaning. Did you black out? I interrupted, trying not to listen even as every detail burned into my mind. No, he admitted. No, no, it's, it's more like a light switch turns off. A part of me just dims, while the voices turn up. Sometimes it's hard to know what is me and what isn't. The fact I can't distinguish, it makes it worse. This explanation didn't inspire much comfort. Once the part of him that was himself had switched back on, and the voices dimmed down, he panicked. Her body couldn't remain forever in the freezer. Nor did he want to risk it burying her in the yard and leaving freshly disturbed soil. But of course my father was an architect. He was very, very good with compartments and compartmentalizing. As soon as I was back at school, he cleared out the closet under the stairs, walling it in so that the space was a foot shorter on the interior. A difference so subtle that you couldn't even see it, with the usual boxes and bins stored under there. What he didn't mention but that I remember growing up is he had been fond of Mary. He kept drawings that she made for him and a little jar with feathers and some pretty stones that she had collected. I believed it was genuine when he sent flowers and letters of condolences to the family. But at the same time as he appeared to mourn her, 
He stepped over her body every night, going up and down the staircase, as did I unwittingly. Eventually, the horror faded, he said. I realized I wasn't going to get caught and I could almost pretend it was someone else who had done it. For the first time, the very first time in years, I had quiet. He closed his eyes and lifted his face toward the ceiling. The absolute perfection of that quiet, you have no idea, Sadie. How blessed that quiet was. I didn't speak. His eyelids fluttered open and he returned his gaze to me. Afterward, when the voices came back, I started to plan the murders whenever the voices got loud. The rest, I think, you can put together. I sat there perfectly still. Now that he had stopped talking, it hit me all at once. Horror at the nature of his crimes. Horror at the reason behind them. I couldn't process it all, not right then. There, in that room, and I finally I said, I need to go, I... I need to go. Sadie, he called after me as I stood up. I looked back, sure that he was going to once again apologize, that he was going to tell me he loved me, that he was going to say that he had tried and he was so sorry and to beg for my forgiveness. But he didn't say any of that. He was smiling, and he said with the most terrifying expression of anticipation that I've ever seen, I was saving you for last. I gasped and fled. Despite his attorney's insistence on a mental health evaluation, my father was declared competent by the courts. He entered a guilty plea and seemed unsurprised, relieved even when he was issued a death sentence. His time on death row was mostly spent in isolation. I was permitted occasional visits, but during these brief breaks from his solitude, we conversed very little. He would ask me how I was doing, trying to make sure that I was keeping my grades up as I entered college, but then he would go quiet. The rest of the time would just be the two of us sitting in silence while he bowed his head, slumped against the table. On my last visit, my father asked me if I believed his account. I didn't know what to say. I wasn't in the habit of lying and he almost always saw through me anyway. I just looked at him sadly. Finally, I said, I don't know, Dad. Am I just a monster? Are you? I wondered. He sighed and whispered, I don't know either, um, but if it's genetic, you should probably go and get yourself regular visits with a psychiatrist, given the affliction of both myself and your mother. I'm already seeing someone. Did he think I wasn't after all this? He rubbed his eyes. He seemed very tired. Finally, he spoke. You know, Sadie, through everything your mother went through and now me, the doctors told me that demons can't be real. That if there were ghouls, demons, spirits, ghosts, there would be evidence. But murderers, abusers, delusional psychopaths, serial killers... These are all real and so, I must be one of these evil men, but, he sighed, it seems such hubris to think that if we haven't scientifically proven something, that means it isn't real. I mean, supposing there were things beyond our understanding, things like I've told you, what do you think would happen when someone who's got what I've got told the world? No one would ever believe them. And do you know, Sadie, my love, that's the worst part. That's the worst part. He put his head in his hands. It always distressed him very much when I didn't believe him. Dad, I sighed. What is it you want? Redemption, forgiveness. It's not like I could give him those things. You still don't understand, he burst. You think this is about evil. This thing in me, it didn't want those children. Then why the heck did you kill them? Dad, if it didn't make you do it, then why? What do you, what does it want? The same thing, he sobbed, that I've wanted for years and years and years. As he spoke for the first time in my entire life, I felt a chill in his presence. 
A chill that started at my nape and trickled down my spine like ice water. Deep, gut-clenching, heart-racing fear. Every instinct screamed. I leaned back and that's what saved my life when he lunged, howling. You! I fell over backwards, scrambling away while the guards rushed to restrain him. He writhed, screaming at me, spittle flecking his lips. Get back here! You're a terrible daughter! Get back here right now! He spewed invective, words that no man should say about his own daughter. In my last look at him, it almost appeared as if he was tearing himself apart. Blood running down his face from where his hands tried to restrain his mouth. His fingers had jabbed into his eyes, blinding him so that he couldn't see me. So that when he shook the guards off, burly though they were, he groped sightlessly for me. I shrank against the wall as he just barely missed my foot. Blood streaming from his eyes like tears until the guards caught a hold of him again. And I fled. Victor Chen never completed his sentence. He was found beaten to a pulp and his throat slit. Proudly the guards looked the other way and let it happen. To be honest, I think it was a mercy for him. His long ordeal was finally over. But I do think often about what he said at the end. If hauntings are confined only to the experiences of the haunted, how can we ever know? How can we tell the difference between a haunted man and a madman? I'm not sure you can. Certainly the courts and doctors couldn't. But whether it was real or not, I finally understand what he meant when he said it didn't want those children. I should have figured it out sooner simply based on what he had told me of my mother. First, she killed her twin sister, and then her own child, my twin, and very nearly me. All those she loved. As for why she never tried to kill my father, well, I think it's because she did something much worse. Cursing him with the most terrible fate of all. It was in her final words. The ones he mumbled so I couldn't make them out at first. Her last words to him were, I'm sorry. It wouldn't let me die without someone new. Which brings us to my father's turn as host. All the children he killed, the ages ranged from 8 to 18. The last one had recently celebrated her 18th birthday just as I had been about to. They were nearly always, in fact, girls my own age. You see, this is what he meant when he said it didn't want them. It wants what you love. It wouldn't let him die. It wouldn't let him rest. But while he succumbed to its evil in every other sense, committing the most terrible of acts and becoming a quite literal monster, still, sometimes I think about the fact that in the end, he managed never to give it what it really wanted. That in his own warped way, he continued protecting me. Because every one of my father's victims was really just a stand-in. Like stabbing a doll instead of the real thing. Each murder just a substitute for me. I would like to think that he won. That he prevented it from getting what it wanted. Or passing on to anybody else. That even though he couldn't kill himself, it lost when his throat was slit, eliminating both him and it from the world. But, a couple of weeks ago, I saw in the newspaper that a pastor from one of the local churches, a progressive-minded, good-hearted woman known for making prison visits and helping the most unfortunate in society, had been arrested for the abuse and murder of two elderly left in her care. When asked why she had committed such a crime, this woman who for decades had served the community with kindness and charity, who by all accounts loved her clients very dearly, covered her face and said, with apparent confusion, a phrase that gave me chills in its terrible, intimate familiarity. I had to.